right to a Fox News alert. North Korea reportedly on the brink of another ballistic missile test less than a day after the rogue regime claims it tested a hydrogen bomb five times more powerful than the one the U.S. used to end World War II at Hiroshima. The U.N. Security Council now calling an emergency meeting in a matter of hours. Right. Benjamin Hall is following the developments from London. Good morning, Benjamin. Yeah, Pete Abbey and Clayton, good morning. Worrying reports out of North Korea and South Korea today uh, amid suggestions that they might be doubling down on their nuclear test yesterday. South Korean defense officials say they are seeing signs that the North is preparing a possible ICBM test, an intercontinental ballistic missile. So yesterday they carried out their sixth nuclear test, which they claim was a miniaturized hydrogen bomb believed to be 10 times more powerful than anything they've tested in the past. And then if today's test goes ahead, they will effectively be testing the possible delivery delivery system for that bomb. And if it goes ahead, all eyes on whether or not it's intercontinental and whether or not it could reach the continental US. Today, South Korea also responded to yesterday's nuclear test with live fire exercises of their own, both ground and air launched rockets. The drills carried out by the South simulated the targeting of that nuclear site where North Korea carried out the bomb test deep inside a mountain. These continued provocations from North Korea have led to a dangerous face-off and led to global condemnation. Now, South Korean defense officials have also told their parliament that the U.S. would seek to deploy a nuclear-powered aircraft carrier to the region. And all this comes just days after North Korea fired a medium-range ballistic missile over Japan. And for the first time, North Korea has now specified the possibility of an electromagnetic pulse attack on the U.S., which could sow chaos and destruction far wider. So North Korea on a path to real uh, devastation if they pursue, uh, continue down this road. And just we wait to see what happens today at that U.N. Security Council meeting. Back to you guys. All right, Benjamin Hall, live Benjamin, thank you. this morning. You know, the president had, you know, people say, well, is there a red line here? Has the president drawn a red line? He said, we will never allow North Korea to get an intercontinental, intercontinental ballistic missile that has a nuclear warhead attached. Our country has set red lines, to your point, Clayton, over numerous administrations, Republican and Democrat. Intolerable to have right. Kim Jong-un with nuclear weapons. Here we are at the precipice. He has them right. and the technology technology potentially to deliver them, you marry the two, and then you've got a big problem. Yeah, well, this has been the goal for, you know, the, the Un family, the Kim, the Kim family for generations, right? The grandfather, the dad, now the son, Kim Jong-un. This has been their goal all along. They're now basically here. Now the question is, do they have the equipment to travel that weapon to where they want to take it? And then what options do we have? We heard a little bit more from the administration yesterday on where they're, how they're thinking about this, where we go from here. Here's a bit of that from Defense Secretary James Mattis. Any threat to the United States or its territories, including Guam, uh, or our allies, will be met with a massive military response, a response both effective and overwhelming. King Jong-un should take heed of the United Nations Security Council's unified voice. All members unanimously agreed on the threat North Korea poses, and they remain unanimous in their commitment to the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula because we are not looking to the total annihilation of a country, namely North Korea. But as I said, we have many options to do so. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> said as only James Mattis would say it, uh, understated, but the message is very clear. We don't want to totally annihilate you. But we could. But oh, we could. But you say understated. Yeah, we if we need to. You, understated. you say understated because there's some history in the way that he's made some comments in the past. There, there, yes. there's, no, uh, there's no covering up anything he's trying to say. It's very direct. Yeah. Like he said this back in 2003. He said, be polite, be professional, but have a plan to kill everyone you meet. So the only the way he can do that, right? No, it's amazing. <laughs> he was a, he's a Marine. He was serving in Iraq. Uh, and at that and, and, and serve in Iraq and Afghanistan. And in that particular quote, that is the reality in this modern battlefield where you're, you're conducting counterinsurgency, you're walking among civilians. Be polite, be courteous, talk to the people, don't make them feel like you're the enemy. But at any moment, someone could turn on you and you better have a plan to yeah. kill that truck person. could be driving so, up an IED. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. It's, it's a very clear truth. The reality is the same with, with North Korea. We want to, listen, we're not going to agitate. We don't want a war with you. We don't have no issue with your people. But if you're going to continue to pursue this, then we have a plan to kill you. And that's a fact. Well, we also heard from him the other day saying, look, there are there are diplomatic ways that we can solve this. And so we had a number of experts on the show yesterday talking about the economic sanctions that could really put put North Korea in a vice. And we heard yesterday from Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin on Fox News Sunday with Chris Wallace, who said, look, these are some of the things we've already started doing. Listen. We've already started with sanctions against North Korea, but I am going to draft a sanctions package to send to the president for his strong consideration that anybody that wants to do trade or business with them would be prevented from doing trade or business with us. 
But you know, you have a lot of people that say, you know what, sanctions can only do so much. That's actually not the answer. That's not going to get China to get into that corner to push North Korea mm -hmm. to, to, to downscale what they're doing. So Ambassador John Bolton is one of those, one of those critics. Right. And he was on yesterday. He, he was on an Fox advisor Report. to the president often, oftentimes, by the way. They, they speak uh, regularly. Yes, he, so he talked about a unified Korea and how ultimately down the road that is going to be how we move forward from here. We've heard that from a number of people. But also, as I said, hitting hard on sanctions, the fact that that's not the answer. Here's what he said. I think it's important for people to understand North Korea doesn't have an economy like other small countries like, say, the Netherlands or uh, Hungary or something like that. It's a 25 million person prison camp. The sanctions simply give people a warm and fuzzy feeling that we're doing something about North Korea. We are not. Uh, if this administration follows the same policies as the Clinton, Bush, and Obama administrations of carrots and sticks and mm -hmm. efforts to persuade North Korea, it will fail just like they did. He's comfortable in, fact. in having his own people be malnourished right. to the point where they, exactly. they develop glaucoma and they have eye problems because they're not getting the proper mm -hmm. nourishment that they need. Do you think this guy cares about having his people well, be Well, I'm not, I'm not sure that China actually cares as much about sanctions. You know what they're most concerned about? They've already digested, accepted the fact that we're going to have a nuclear North Korea. I think they're mm -hmm. okay with that. It's they a made it clear they're okay with that. What China is most concerned about is going to war with North Korea because that would be a disaster for them. You think about the millions of people that would go over the border. Right. Into China, you think about losing their dominance in that region. So we've got to continue to have that tough rhetoric, particularly as it relates to China, and say if you do not help us with North Korea, we are going to continue to threaten taking military action. Speaking there. of that tough rhetoric, uh, the president tweeted 17 hours ago yesterday, the United States is considering, in addition to other options, stopping all trade with any country doing business with North Korea. Imagine the threat of stopping, I mean, that's to China. Mm -hmm. Stopping all trade with China would have massive impact on both of our economies, no doubt. Yeah. But if you believe that, that this is an existential threat, that North Korea cannot have this capability, you have to start taking those kind of real dramatic steps. Yeah. By the way, in the next segment, we're going to have a Segment, you talk about the evil of Kim Jong Un. We're going to un pull back the curtain a little bit more on who this guy really is and what he really Do wants. Do we want to, to know? Yeah, <laughs> All right, so at 8 o'clock on the show, we've got Heather Noward on, our good friend here at Fox and Friends, but also right. now the spokesperson for the State Department. So we look uh, so forward to talking to her a little later on the show. Meanwhile, the other big story of the morning what could happen tomorrow? President Trump, what will he do with uh, President Obama's executive action on the Dreamer program, the mm -hmm. DACA program? And it looks like, and we heard reports yesterday in the New York Post that it could be, ex that he could allow 800,000 people to stay, some sort of an amnesty program. We're not now sure. We're going to find out tomorrow specifically, but now we are hearing reports that within six months, the president could end this program. So we're basically extending it for six months while Congress takes action and gets some sort of a plan on the table. Yeah, which, which you've, got, you've got folks that really like that idea because it is the ending of what many believe to be an unconstitutional executive order. But others that say if, when, if Congress is left to do it, either A, they won't do it, which a lot of people who believe in the rule of law, like myself, have say, hey, if you can't, if, if the rule of law exists, it exists. It is what it is. It's not, you know, not easy. It's a tough policy. But what if Congress does get together and do something? You know, Paul Ryan likes to get together with Democrats and advocate for a lot of things that a lot of conservatives don't really love, including potentially amnesty. So you could see a congressional extension of this program. At least then it wouldn't be extra constitutional. At least right. then it would be the law of the land. So the, the right. question is, if it, you know, we don't really know where the president will go. But as you said, Clayton, the most recent uh, indication is a temporary extension, but the program goes away. It's interesting, actually. If you remember, Marco Rubio was the one that sort of championed this Dreamers bill. And had they gone forward, that it would have been permanent. But yeah. former President Barack Obama was like, no, I want to put this on my, on my resume, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not permanent now because it was an executive action. So that's a great point of whatever Congress does with that, that would actually be the permanent law. And that where does stand. the wall, exactly. And where does the wall fall into that? Mm -hmm. You know, what, you've got or so many grassroots together. folks saying, well, you want to do all this stuff for, for, for folks that are here illegally. What about the citizens that are here legally? And the fact that you don't prioritize a lot of things that matter to them, that'll be a very interesting part of the conversation. Yeah, so absolutely. let us know your thoughts on this. Friends at FoxNews.com, you can weigh in on that. Meanwhile, we've got some headlines. Jillian standing by with a look at those. Hey, morning, Jillian. Jillian. Good Monday morning to you guys. See you at home as well. Straight to a Fox News alert. Harvey's wrath now blamed for at least 50 deaths as the search for hundreds still missing intensifies. And overnight, the evacuation zone around the chemical plant damaged by flooding lifted after six days. The Arkema plant in Crosby using controlled burns to destroy highly flammable materials. And the devastation could not stop these Texans from attending mass. The church was destroyed in floodwater, so parishioners set up a tent and held Sunday services outside.
out west, fires raging at this hour. In California, the governor issuing a state of emergency as the largest wildfire to hit Los Angeles consumes over 5,800 acres. Four firefighters have been hurt but should be okay. And crews rescuing more than 150 hikers from one of these wildfires near Portland. Dozens reuniting uh, with their families. One hiker taken to the hospital. The rest are all okay. Minimum wage activists set to take aim at Republican governors as they rally across the country on this Labor Day. The Fight for 15 group aiming to raise the minimum wage to $15, writing on their website, quote, in 2018, the worst Republican governors, ones in battleground states, are all up for re-election. Let's throw them out. Fast food workers in more than 300 cities are expected to strike today. And breaking Royals news. Prince William and Kate expecting their third child. Kensington Palace just confirming this exciting news. <laughs> Duchess Kate, though, is suffering, guys, from severe morning sickness. She did, though, with her previous two pregnancies, forcing her to cancel upcoming events. The Duke and Duchess already have two young children. Prince George, as you know, four years old. He begins preschool this year. Princess Charlotte is two. The royal couple's new baby will be the fifth in line to the British throne and the Queen's sixth great-grandchild. Oh. See? Even, even princesses. All the yeah. privilege, none of the morning. So you're fifth in line. Great like music. <laughs> they have a the cutest party. family, though. I know. But seriously, I mean, her third child in morning sickness with all three that... I don't know from experience. Hey, I had terrible morning sickness. Awful. I can't imagine being in her role and having to do all these events. Clearly, I, I've right. heard she's had to cancel a lot of them. That's when they always know that she's possibly pregnant because she, she can't go. Yes. Or you reach for wine. Like, I can't. <laughs> You're pregnant again. That's the worst. <laughs> Indication. Thanks, Jillian. Yeah. Very cool. Thanks. All right. Well, the terrifying moments at the racetrack. Burning fuel sent flying into the stands. Spectators catching fire. Look at that. We'll show you what happened next. Ooh. And North Korea now planning another missile launch just a day after claiming it is ready to fire a hydrogen bomb. So just how evil is Kim Jong-un? Is there a meter for that? A former CIA agent says he is the most paranoid man on the planet. It's coming up next. We are back with a Fox News alert. This morning, UN Security Council, the UN Security Council is calling an emergency meeting as North Korea reportedly prepares yet another ballistic missile launch. Barely a day after it tested a hydrogen bomb, what it claims to be a hydrogen bomb, five times stronger than the one dropped on Nagasaki. So, just how evil is Kim Jong-un, this man who seeks these, these weapons, and his secretive communist regime, his dictatorship? Here to weigh in, a former CIA station chief and vice president of SPG, Daniel Hall. Daniel, thanks for joining us this morning. So, you know, it's kind of an academic exercise when you talk about size of bombs and types of intercontinental ballistic missiles, but the nature of the regime oftentimes matters the most. Take us behind the curtain of Kim Jong-un. Well, I think Kim Jong-un has got to be one of the most ruthless, uh, paranoid dictators on the planet, and his, his focus on, on marrying a ballistic missile capability with nuclear weapons just reflects um, his interest in, in the ultimate deterrent, uh, regime security. It's an existential part of his national security strategy, and he's overwhelmingly focused, as he should be, on the external threats to, uh, to his regime. You say, as he should be. He's, he's the third in the line of, <laughs> of, of his family to have this absolute control. Uh, do you believe he's a rational actor or, or a crazy man? We hear both words thrown out a lot. I think that's a, a debatable point. I know that uh, General McMaster has said that he might not be very rational. I think right now, uh, certainly of great importance from the perspective of, of the intelligence community is to produce that leadership profile of Kim Jong-un, which outlines uh, his personality and his plans and his intentions, and in particular his reaction, for example, to yesterday's very direct statement from General Mattis about how committed we are to deterring North Korea from launching on our homeland mm -hmm. or uh, our territory. You talk about about a profile, this is a guy who had his own brother assassinated. Uh, I mean, what, what are the depths of depravity he's gone to to maintain that grip of power? I mean, he's, he's mounted uh, purges of, of North Korean senior officials, including, as you mentioned, his own half-brother, reminiscent of the sort of uh, purges that Stalin uh, mounted against against his uh, Soviet leadership in the in the, in the 30s, and uh, it just reflects the extent to which I think Kim Jong Un is so um, concerned about threats not just from outside North Korea, sure. uh, in the peninsula from our allies, uh, but all and the United States, but also internally as well. Daniel, in a world full of threats, whether it's Iran, ISIS, North Korea, Russia, China, where does North Korea rank on your scale? 
mean, North Korea is an extraordinarily high threat. Obviously, there are others out there, uh, ISIS, Al-Qaeda, um, Iran, you know, Russia. China is a long-term strategic threat, and I think we need to be cognizant that China is our strategic uh, competitor, not our ally in the region. Uh, yeah, by yeah. some estimates, China is responsible for, for billions and billions of dollars worth of intellectual property theft in this country, and they view the Korean Peninsula far differently uh, than we do. They're concerned about the balance of power there, a unification of the peninsula uh, under Seoul uh, leadership. It's, Daniel, it's, we have to leave it right there, unfortunately, but such a great point. We've got to be clear-eyed about China. Daniel Hoffman, thanks for your expertise. More Fox Thank and you. Friends on the other side. Welcome back. Some quick headlines now for you. Hundreds of dead veterans collecting paychecks from the government. A brand new Social Security audit finding more than 700 people received nearly $38 million even after the VA reported them as dead. Investigators say they'll pay out another seven.